Okay, yes. Okay, so I'll go into sharing a screen. And uh, that's one of my empty screens. And um, I don't know whether you see my whole screen, including bits of stuff on the right and the clock and so on. Yes, we, we uh, can see the whole desktop. Right, well, um, the, the bit that I'll be focusing on is a bit I'm now shrinking and expanding, which is really, oh, what have I broken? Uh, which is um, this uh, Firefox panel, which has got notes, which I shall go through then every now and again, switch to other bits of what's in Firefox. So um, this is my title, How Did Biological Evolution Produce Brains Able to Make Discoveries in Geometry and Topology? That cannot be explained, I claim cannot be explained by known brain mechanisms. And they're not replicated in current logic-based AI or artificial neural nets, I'll explain that later. Um, I got interested in those mechanisms around about 1959 when I, I was a, ma a math student in Oxford and I got very friendly with philosophers and I'd also started reading philosophy. And then I have heard philosophers making statements about the nature of mathematics that I thought were just wrong. And I got deeper and deeper into the arguments and I got permission to switch from maths to philosophy. Um, and uh, so I did a DPhil in philosophy, which finished in 1962. But I've always felt that the work wasn't complete. And at that time, I'd never learned anything about computing, um, except in the very abstract. I mean, I'd heard of Alan Turing and Turing machines and so on, but I hadn't learned to program. And in fact, there were very few people had it around that time. Uh, several years later, uh, when I was a young philosophy lecturer at Sussex University, um, a guy who was one of the leading vision researchers, his name was Max Kluse, uh, spelled C-L-O-W-E-S, uh, and I became very friendly. And he was a, uh, he had been de designing programs to analyze images, and he also was highly intelligent and imaginative. And uh, talking to him just sparked me into thinking, that's the way I need to do my philosophy learn to program and then show how one, how Immanuel Kant's theories of mathematics could be uh, justified by building a kind of baby robot that grows up the way a human might grow up to be a mathematician. Um, and uh, I spent a long time trying and learned an awful lot and met lots of interesting people and got some very interesting students. Um, uh, including Luke, who's there. Um, but at the time of the Turing centenary, which was 2012, I came round to thinking that maybe it can't be done using digital computers. Um, a lot of work had been done on so-called neural nets, but uh, I think they um, have nothing much to do with the problem, and I'll say why later. Um, so I started wondering whether perhaps it's got something to do with brain chemistry. And uh, that was actually sparked partly by a remark that Alan Turing had in his 1950 paper, uh, the one that introduced what most people call the Turing test, but he didn't call, think of it as a test. He, he made a prediction that in 50 years time, you could play this game and uh, the machine would be found out most of the time, <laughs> but not always. It was a very weak prediction and it more or less came true. But anyway, um, he uh, died a couple of years after writing that paper, uh, no, sorry, a few years after writing the paper, he died in 54, that paper was 1950. In 1952, he wrote a paper called The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis, which is now very highly cited by physicists, chemists, mathematicians, but not many philosophers or psychologists or neuroscientists. And it's about how if you have a couple of um, chemicals diffusing in a liquid uh, and they have different properties, you can get all sorts of patterns forming. And uh, he suggested this might explain the formation of patterns on skins and of animals of various kinds and also on plants and so on. 
And I just wondered why was Alan Turing, who was doing all that previous deep stuff about computation, how minds work and so on, thinking about patterns. And I somehow remembered that in the 1950 paper, the one uh, in mind, there was one sentence. I don't know how my brain took me back to that because I hadn't looked at that paper for a long time, but suddenly it came dredged out of the depths of my memory. The sentence which said, in brains, chemistry is at least as important as electricity. I don't know if anyone else remembers reading that who's read the that Turing paper is not quoted very often, but he didn't say why. So I began to wonder, perhaps he had some kind of hunch that we need computers based on chemistry rather than these digital machines using electricity. Um, and I thought maybe the stuff about patterns was really just a side issue that he'd got into as a, as a result of thinking about what you can do with chemistry. Um, but I have not been able to find any clear, any definite evidence that he think that he really did think what I claimed he thought. Um, and he certainly didn't write anything that I've been able to find or anyone else been able to find about how it might work. So I'm no Alan Turing, but as far as I know, nobody else is trying to develop that project of his. And so at least if I can get enough clever people to take it seriously, maybe um, in another hundred years or so, we might be able to do what he might have done, or maybe it would have taken him hundred years because I think it's very difficult. Anyway, that's, so what I'm getting at is that there are things brain can do, and I'll come back to why I think that and the sorts of things they are that I think are not currently explained. Um, and at certain points, I might stop and just find out if anybody wants to make any particular points or ask any particular questions. But for the time being, I'll just move on a bit. Um, I want to give some examples of the sorts of things that I was particularly interested in because uh, as I tried to bring out in the email discussion preceding all this, uh, I've been finding that whereas when I was at school in the 1950s, I was taught to do ancient geometry. That meant using diagrams to prove things. Sorry. Oh. And, uh, and uh, hardly anybody else that I met had any experience of that knowledge of that. They thought a proof was what is now since, I guess, the uh, middle of the um, last century, mainly taught as a kind of proof in school, where you have axioms expressed in, in logic, and you have um, uh, rules for deriving things from those axioms, or there may be other, they're not necessarily a collection of axioms and, and things derived from them. You can have other structures, but they're all made of symbols, some, uh, uh, sequences of symbols, uh, algebraic expressions, but instead of numbers, um, there'll be things like P, Q, and R, or whatever. And instead of plus and minus and so on, you will have other logical symbols. And that's what many people now think constitutes a proof. Now, let me just see if I've got, I'll come back to that thing later. Uh, where am I? I've gone the wrong way. Um, I need to use what I've got in front of me instead of looking down at the wrong thing. Okay. Um, he has a part of a tutorial which is online. I think I sent around a link to it, but I can provide it later if, uh, by email if anyone wants it, or if you remember Euclid's big problem number file. Um, it's just illustrating the sort of thing I learned to do at school. Um, can you hear her talk? You can't hear what she's saying, but can you read the script? Okay, so I'll let it go and I'll say, she, she's saying if you want to bisect an angle, there's no measuring device for measuring angles and working out what the half of an angle is and then drawing a new angle with that. But using these compasses and a ruler and a pencil, 
she's going to show how to bisect an angle. And for many, some of you, I hope all of you, this will be trivial and obvious and something you've learned before, but there might be one or two who've never seen this sort of thing as a proof. It's totally different from writing collections, sequences of, of symbols. She's, she's going to bisect it. You can just draw a circle with the compasses. Then she, she's got two points created and she uses each of them to draw another circle. So you, there are two more circles. You get a new point and then you join them up. So uh, then you can use some other bits of geometry to prove that um, because uh, all of the circles have the same radius and that means that various lines are the same length. For instance, um, this circle here has center over there and it's got the same radius as this circle here. Uh, sorry, it was center here and this circle over there. And therefore this point here is going to be the same distance to that center as it is to that center because it's on the boundary of that circle and it's on the boundary of that circle. And therefore you can say that line is the same length as that line. And then using that line, that line, the same length. And you can show that they're both the same lengths as those two lines because those two lines were, uh, uh, th those lengths were formed by drawing a circle around here with center over there using the same radius. She had just moved the compass around. Uh, that preserved the length. And then you use a little bit of extra reasoning to, sh to join these things up and prove that as a result, um, this angle must be the same as that angle. Anyway, I'm, I, I'm going to, I'm hoping that that will be reasonably clear, even for people who've never studied geometry before. And she has a lot of other examples, all explained very clearly, very nicely in this video. So, um, another theorem, which you've all heard of, um, out of curiosity, I wonder how many people have ever encountered a proof of it. Well, maybe I'll come back to that later. But uh, Pythagoras theorem, I'm sure, sure you all know, states that if you have an arbitrary triangle, this is on Wikipedia, Pythagoras theorem, you can find it yourself later. Uh, if you have an arbitrary um, right angle triangle, so there's a right angle over there, and then it's got two sides adjoining that right angle, and then the third side is opposite to the right angle. Uh, Pythagoras theorem says if you form a square on each of these sides, then the two smaller squares add up to the bigger square. And I've discovered lots of people know that, but they haven't a clue how it was ever proved or whatever. Um, well, it was proved long before Pythagoras, as you can see from the Wikipedia, I think it, possibly a thousand years before Pythagoras was born or something. And there are several hundred different proofs. Um, and in here is a rather nice proof, which I can generate by just clicking on this diagram. Now, is this going to work? I click on the diagram and I, I get um, these two, sorry, these two squares we have to show are made up of the, um, uh, add up together to the area of that square. So if I click on that, oops, I think I gave the wrong, no, I, I've done something wrong here. Um, it's supposed to be a animated, perhaps I, perhaps because I'm showing it like this is not working. But what it does, or what you can do if you think about it later, is um, uh, you can divide the squares in half and then move them around. And then you'll eventually be able to show that if uh, that, that the, uh, the portions of the, uh, the halves of these, 
of this square and the halves of this square together can fit in that square and exactly fill it up. Um, and I don't quite know why this doesn't now show the animation, uh, but maybe because it doesn't like being shown in Zoom or something. So I will leave that for now and uh, people may be able to try it themselves. It's Wikipedia Pythagorean theorem and the diagrams on the right and you get the animation if you click on it. At least I did when I tried earlier. Uh, the animation is uh, a few images down from that. Ah, thank you very much. Uh, a few uh, images. So I have to go back. No. Oh, this one. Is it going to work? Yep. There you see it happening. So we started with this and um, uh, we have C over here. The, sorry, C squared over here. Over here. Let's do it again. C squared is that. And this whole diagram is C squared plus that, plus that, plus that, plus that. And this whole diagram is also C squared plus these two, plus these two, And if you, no, okay. I'll leave it to you to look at it and think about it. But for now, uh, it's merely just an illustration that you can have proofs that are not collect another illustration of a proof that isn't a sequence of formulae, but is a process in which you move diagrams around and to see which relationships are preserved. Sorry, it's somewhat. I uh, hear someone talking, but I can't hear what they're saying. No. Anyway, let's leave Pythagoras for the moment. That was the proof. And I'm just, I had rehearsed it earlier and I, my brain's getting soft. I just completely forgot that I had to go down the Wikipedia page. Sorry about that. And thanks for rescuing me. Okay, so that is, um, you've now seen some examples of proofs. Um, that make use of uh, diagrams as opposed to logic. And there are thousands of them. Well, I, I don't know how many, but uh, a very large number of them. And they are enormous fun once you get into the hang of it. Discovering a new way of proving some theorem can be a great joy. Um, and uh, I will see if I can give you one to think about. It's not a standard theorem. It's just something I stumbled across now. Where have I put it? Oh, yes. Um, this is a picture, not a very good picture, but I'm sure you'll agree. It's a picture of a, of a polyhedron, namely three-dimensional object completely enclosed in plane surfaces. So you can see a subset of the surfaces, not very well drawn here. And each surface is bounded by straight lines, obviously, and they have different shapes. These are triangular lines. Here's something else with five sides. And there are edges and there are vertices. And uh, I, I'm going to ask a question, <laughs> which you will need time to think about. And um, I'll leave it to you to think about later. If I take a, a saw, which is what that is, as you can see, I'm not very good at drawing, and you use that saw to produce a planar slice, that's to say you cut a plane through, through that polyhedron, so as to remove exactly one vertex, say this vertex, so you could cut it through there. And uh, you can see you can have cuts at different angles and, and uh, different locations, all of which have the effect of just removing one vertex while leaving all these. But new things happen as a result of that cut. You remove part of the top of the thing, and then I'm not going to ask a question about what's left. The question is, what does that do to the total number of vertices You've got some there, around there. That one's gone. 
and edges and surfaces. So um, if you think about it, you will come up uh, and you may not be able to do it while I'm talking and maybe I shouldn't even recommend that you do it while I'm talking, but uh, I could leave it as homework and we can have a discussion on the lug mailing list if, if you discover interesting things. Um, but I've chosen that because it's not, as far as I know, it's not a standard theorem, but I think most people, after thinking about it for a while, can work out what the answer is to the question, what happens to the total number of vertices V, the number of edges E, the number of faces F, if you just do a planar slice and remove what, exactly one vertex. And uh, there are possible complications, which I will, um, for now, I'll not go into. So, um, went the wrong way again. That's an example uh, of the way in which if you, if you play around with diagrams and you can think about things you can do to them, you, you may be able to come up with things nobody else has thought of. Uh, they may or may not be things other people have thought of, but, but at least you have thought of them, you've discovered them. And if you work at them, you can actually find a proof for yourself. And when you're doing that, I hope you will agree, you are not simply starting from axioms expressed in the form of logical expressions or algebraic expressions and manipulating those symbols, you're doing something very different. And my suggestion is that those abilities um, to make discoveries in ancient geometry came out of deep ancient biological abilities that we share with, to some extent, uh, not fully with any other species, but to some extent with various other species. And um, for example, do I have something over here to say about that? Um, no, never mind. Uh, for example, uh, some of you will have squirrels in your garden. And if you watch squirrels, they can do quite amazing things. Uh, uh, and there are lots of videos which you can search for of squirrels defeating squirrel-proof bird feeders. So um, uh, we have a bird feeder that is in a um, uh, sort of rectangular plastic box, which has got peanuts in it. And it's got suckers on the back of the blocks and you can stick, the, stick it in the middle of a window pane. And uh, there's no easy way to get to it from the ground. And we've had squirrels eyeing it uh, uh, over many years. And a couple have shown amazing ingenuity. One in particular noticed that he could climb up the uh, frame of the window on about a yard or so to the right of the, um, of the, uh, the bird feeder with a very narrow grip. You can imagine yourself climbing up, holding on to uh, 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 something that is on a vertical surface and you can just grip it with your right and left uh, hands and feet and slowly go up. Anyway, the squirrel went up and my wife managed to get a picture of it um, until it was at, at a, 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 a thing a bit above the height of the bird feeder and then launched itself sideways in such a way that it was just able to land in the bird feeder and then get at the nuts. Um, I don't think it succeeded the first time it tried. <laughs> the squirrels can also drop down and save themselves with their fall. But it had almost certainly never done anything remotely like that uh, previously because in the natural environment in which squirrels grow up, you don't normally have the opportunity to climb up the side of a sheet of glass, then launch yourself sideways parallel to the sheet of glass to get your food. If you're a squirrel, you do all sorts of other things like going up trees and climbing poles and whatever. Anyway, that's, that's to me is a, an illustration of a claim that the um, ability of the ancient Egyptians and Chinese and Indians and Babylonians and others who made masses of geometrical discoveries and found proofs and construction. Uh, those abilities are probably related to uh, 
products of evolution in other animals that interact with spatial structures and can solve spatial problems. And uh, apart from squirrels, there are elephants and orangutans and nest-building birds and many others. Um, there are also uh, babies uh, that can't yet talk that can manipulate their environment. Now I'm going to see if I can find my um, uh, video of a baby. Uh, well, this is a, a child, I think aged about 17 months. Um, I hope, despite the fact that it's quite small, you can see it on the screen. I think if I enlarge it to the full screen, it goes very blurry. She had previously been at the far end of that carpet playing with a pencil and scribbling on bits of paper. And then for some reason, she stopped and crawled along towards where this bit of paper was, holding a pencil in her hand. And when she got to the, to the paper, she got up on her knees, as you see her there, and picked up the paper. And at that point, I was watching and I had a rather old camera and I thought something interesting is going to happen. So I turned it on. And I managed to get this. Now I'm hoping uh, you'll be able to see what happens if I just um, turn this on. She pushes the pencil through the paper. So that was effortless um, for her. You'd have to do a lot of training to get a modern robot to be able first time to hold a floppy sheet of paper and just push a pencil through it. But anyway, she did that. And I thought, wow, that's impressive. But I didn't know what was coming next. Then she pulled it out and then did something totally unexpected for me. She apparently decided she wanted to push it through the same hole from the other side. So as you see, she took the paper, swung the pencil around, went in, pushed it through, pulled it out, brought it back, and then pushed it through the same hole again. Then she put it down. She didn't look around for applause or anything. She paid no attention to anyone else in the room. She didn't notice that I had my camera there. She merely saw something involving spatial structures and possible processes, and somehow was motivated to perform that action. And um, I was uh, very surprised when she just picked it up and managed to push the pencil, holding it at the back end, with, you know, quite accurately pushing through. But what happened after that was amazingly complicated. The thing she did in parallel, um, so she got the pencil through, she pulled it out, and then Notice that she took the angle of the paper, she brings her hand up over her right shoulder, she changes the angle of the pencil at the same time as she's doing that, so it's starting to point to this hole, she brings her head round so that she can see what's going on around here, and then pushes it through, gets it in first time. Anyway, it, I don't know if there's any robot on the planet uh, that would be able to do that. And if there is, it would take an enormous amount of training from everything I know about current robotics. Uh, I think Mohan knows a lot more about robotics than I do, and he may or may not want to comment on that later. Um, anyway, that's uh, an illustration of a point I want to make, which is that um, spatial reasoning abilities, the ability to see that something is possible, to see what has to be changed to make other things possible, and then to control processes to realize those possibilities, uh, are uh, a part of natural brains that I think involve mechanisms that nobody in neuroscience or psychology has any clue how to explain. Um, and if they say, well, she has been trained by her previous experiences, um, I don't think there's any neural net learning mechanism that would be able to transfer training from the kinds of experiences that a child has had before that to that situation and not only provide the ability 
to do what she's done there, but provide the thought of doing it in advance of doing it without anything else coming from outside and saying, no, I want you to solve this problem. Um, anyway, anyone with young children uh, should now start watching them much more carefully and wherever possible take videos and then send them to me. And often I have to watch a video three or four times and then I realize something that's deep and important, which is not at all obvious when you first look at it. I think, I wonder if it's uh, worthwhile temporarily pausing because I want to go on from here to speculate widely about evolution and biology and chemistry and physics, but people might want to, um, before I do that, uh, make some comments or questions. So if I stop sharing the screen for a moment, I click on stop share and um, come back to wherever. Yeah. Um, is, is there anyone who has any objections or wants to say anything? I think, uh, I think I, I, I watch that video with new eyes now, is the best way to put it to what I might have watched before. It's, oh, there's, there's a cute little girl playing with a, playing with a pencil um, versus what's actually going on with it. I think, I think when my brother comes on uh, online at Christmas, he lives abroad, so just be seeing on, on camera like this, and my, he'll have my very young nephew with him. I should be watching to see what he's up to. Well, I think uh, that talking to me damages brains and makes it people see things differently. <laughs> and I hope that's happened to all of you. So we might get a lot more. Was there anyone else who wanted to say anything? Or okay. And uh, there are some comments on the right, and I'm not going to try to read them now. I don't know if uh, Zoom has a mechanism for saving comments, um, but if not, I might be able to read them in the video when it's played back uh, later. Okay, I will move into phase two, which is wild and deep speculations about the universe and everything. Um, if I can now go back to uh, it says speak of you and uh, I have to find my screen share. It's at the bottom. Where was it? Um, share screen, yeah. Right, now let me get back to my, um, where I thought I was going. Uh, which one do I want to, oh, oh yes, yeah, something that's quite nice, which I'll just mention briefly. There's a website and you can find it if you search for Morley's miracle. Morley, M-O-R-L-E-Y, discovered this amazing theorem, which I will demonstrate here, which said, if you start with an arbitrary triangle, and you trisect each of the angles, then where pairs of triangles meet, you get three points. So, sorry, where pair, pairs of trisectors meet. So this is a trisector of that angle, this is a trisector of that angle, they meet over there. And likewise, these two trisectors meet there, these two meet there. And Morley's theorem was that no matter how you change the shape and size of the um, big triangle, this little triangle is always an equilateral triangle. You can see why it's called a miracle. It's just so unobvious. And I've, I've looked at proofs of it and I haven't yet been able to take one in so that I really understand it and can report it. But some of you might find that an interesting challenge if you want to go way beyond all this. Um, did I have anything else I want to say? Okay, we've been through that. Uh, we've been through the pencil. Uh, right, now I want to talk about these two guys. That's David Hume, great Scottish philosopher, and that's Immanuel Kant, great German philosopher. And um, David Hume, I, I'm sure they both studied Euclidean geometry with a standard part of uh, mathematical education for many years um, until very recently. And um, they were, I'm sure they were both very highly educated. Anyway, David Hume, great philosopher, came up 
with a view about knowledge, which essentially said there are exactly two kinds of knowledge. Namely, there's empirical knowledge, which you can get only through sensory mechanisms. You have to go and observe and measure and weigh and so on and, and see what happens in the world, call those matters of fact and real existence. Or else you can look at definitions and see what follows from them. And you call those relations of ideas. And an example would be all bachelors are unmarried. If the definition of a bachelor is someone who's a male and has never been married, then it's trivially obvious that all bachelors are unmarried. If a definition of a brother is that it's somebody who's got a sibling, a male or female sibling, um, uh, then uh, you know what a brother is. Now, if you put the two together, you can talk about bachelor, bachelors who are brothers of someone, they will be uncles, so it'll be bachelor uncles. And now we can consider this sentence, no bachelor uncle is an only child, which is my invention. But I leave it to you to think about it. But you can easily, I hope, work out from the definition of bachelor and uncle and having more than one uh, brother, having a brother or sister uh, being incompatible with being an only child, you'll be able to prove that no bachelor uncle is an only child just using definitions and logic. So that would be an example of what Kant called an analytic proposition and uh, Hume called relations of ideas. They're essentially true by definition plus logical reasoning. And Hume said there's only two kinds of knowledge. There's a knowledge like that, that's relations between ideas. And then everything else is empirical. You've got to go and you've got to go and measure it. Um, you have to look at matters of facts and you have to go and use sensory mechanisms aided by measuring devices and so on. And he said, if anyone claims to have any knowledge that is not true by definition in this sense, and it's not based on observation and measurement and uh, plus some reasoning, then he says, um, uh, it is nothing but sophistry and illusion he was thinking of a lot of religious writing, theology, and but also philosophy and um, metaphysical writing. And Immanuel Kant said, no, that's wrong because he thought about this and it made him realize that there's mathematical knowledge. And I have this evening been introducing you to examples that I think Kant would have regarded as mathematical knowledge that is not just based on definitions plus logic and observation, it's based on a kind of reasoning that goes beyond logic and beyond uh, empirical observation. And it involves the spatial reasoning that we've been getting in these examples of triangles and whatever. So Immanuel Kant wrote that, but he also said he thought it would be very difficult to explain how human brains do this. In fact, one of the paragraphs in his Critique of Pure Reason um, says that it's, it may be that it's an art that will be forever concealed in the depths of the human soul. That's a translation from German. Um, anyway, so he was, he spotted that there is this kind of thing, but he was pessimistic about our ability ever to understand it. And I think he was, his pes pessimism was justified in so far as we haven't yet understood it, because I think it really, it does depend on aspects of how brains work that nobody understands yet. But I don't think it's based on either the logical aspects of brains solely, although that comes in, nor to just learning things from experience where you collect lots of examples and you generalize and say, okay, I now know what happens if I hold something up and I let go of it over here and I hold something up and I let go of it in some other place. Uh, sorry, I forgot you can't see my what I'm doing with my hand. But anyway, uh, if you hold things in various places and let go of them, they move towards the center of the earth. If you're very far from the center of the earth, then other things can happen. But you can only get those things by observation. But Kant said there are things that are different and he claimed that ancient uh, geometrical knowledge was an example. And he also thought there were some other kinds of things which I'm not gonna go into. So the question then is, 
what can we say about mechanisms that might explain how we, and by we, I mean all the people who followed the reasoning that I've been introducing you tonight, and the people long before us who've been discovering those theorems, including Morley's theorem and so on. Um, I can't remember how that sentence started. Anyway, I'm suggesting that maybe by uh, doing a certain sort of investigation that goes beyond what we can do with current computers, we might get some new ideas. And what is it that we can do that goes beyond current computers? Oh, I see something up there that I wasn't aware of. Anyway, what I th think we can do is look at what chemistry does, and in particular, the chemistry that's involved in the processes that go on uh, after um, an organism has been started in the form of an egg, which might, or a seed, and then grows into something very different. It could be a tree, or it could be a human being, or a, a fish, or um, uh, something very different, like um, uh, what's that mobile fungus like thing called that f moves around on the surface? forgotten the name, It'll come, it may come back later. Anyway, there are all these many different life forms and they all depend on chemistry. And um, uh, so the question is, is there something about chemistry that plays a deep role in brains that uh, explains things that can't be explained by the currently highly fashionable way of thinking about brains as networks of neurons sending signals to one another along these neurons and stimulating one another. And then these things can work out uh, the proportions of stimuli that they get from various sources, which cause other things to happen and look for correlations and make discoveries. And that roughly speaking, neural nets are giant statistical collection and using machines. They collect lots and lots of statistical evidence and then they compute probabilities and they derive conclusions. And there are amazing things being achieved by that. But the one thing that cannot be achieved by collecting probabilities, uh, co collecting data and finding ratios and deriving probabilities, one thing you can never do is discover something that's in Kant's category of things that are impossible or necessarily true. Uh, and which aren't explained by David Hume's reasoning by logic and definitions, but explained by the thoughts of spatial reasoning that I've been foisting on you in all these earlier examples where you can see structural relationships, work out consequences, and the way that little girl, the baby, was able to do uh, uh, she clearly knew uh, something about what was going to happen before she did it because, for instance, when she pushed the pencil through the hole, she didn't look under the sheet of paper or something. She knew exactly how to rotate her head or arms and everything else to see what was, where the, the point of the pencil would be coming out. And uh, many people have come up with conjectures, mathematical conjectures, uh, where they've had ideas about what they will see if they do something, and they might find it in certain cases that they try out, but then they've gone beyond what this child has done, and they've been able to come up with a proof, and they've taught it to their students and so on. But that doesn't happen nowadays because the educational fraternity have ruled out the spatial reasoning from most geometric teaching in schools, and uh, the vast majority of the population is now deprived of that. Sadly, I guess there are some schools that are exceptions and schools in Eastern Europe, I gather, uh, some of them anyway, are also exceptions. Right, so what can we say about brain chemistry? Um, now, uh, these are pictures of lots of chicks. Um, if you um, look at an egg, um, a chick egg, it's got a shell. And if you break it open, you won't find anything remotely like a chick. 
uh, if it's a, it may be a fertilized egg, in which case deep down inside it, there'll be this tiny fragment of the egg that's got DNA. And then it's surrounded by all the other stuff. Um, and somehow, if a mother hen sits on that chick or nowadays, uh, I was going to say cold-bloodedly, but that's not the right word. But anyway, nowadays in incubators without any mother hen, um, uh, you, you can have the babies, um, sorry, yeah, the chicks, the eggs kept for a while. And after a while, chicks start bashing the shell from the inside because of these things, because chicks form in the egg and they come out looking like these creatures. And not only do they have these, you know, lots of fluffy feathers, big eyes and so on, and a couple of feet, they also have capabilities. They can come out and walk, they can uh, walk towards the mother pretty soon after birth. They can also um, pick for food and the same is true also, of course, of ducks and geese and ma many other kinds of birds. Um, so that raises a question, what on earth was going on inside that egg? Uh, we have tiny, tiny fragment of matter with a rather complicated bit of chemical stuff at the beginning, which we now know Kant didn't. And, I mean, it's only been known during the last century, uh, has uh, this molecular stuff, DNA and other stuff. And somehow all the chemistry in there uh, is able to reorganize itself and assemble new and increasingly complex structures going through a whole lot of different processes. There must be different sorts of processes. There are initial processes of just getting the thing going maybe within a single cell, but obviously pretty soon there are going to be lots of different cells. Uh, <laughs> you need many different cells to make a chick. The cells that go into the feathers, the cells that go into the muscles, the cells that go into the bones, cells that go into blood vessels and so on. All these different kinds of cells have to be manufactured. Um, and they are manufactured inside cells, which do things like splitting and dividing or just growing and changing their shape and so on. And all somehow controlled by the chemistry that was in that stuff in the tiny speck right at the beginning. But how? And uh, I think uh, very little was understood about that before the middle of the last century when uh, Although people had an idea that it was uh, involved complex molecular structures, work had been done using microscopes and so on, uh, suggesting that there were these lengthy structures. In fact, in 1944, um, Schrodinger wrote a book called What is Life? And he talked about what was then known about these long molecules. And he came up with a, um, in that book, with an argument that the molecular structures must somehow have the information that can be used for building humans and, and other organisms in a reliable way. Uh, he used an example of reliable reproduction, uh, uh, a lip distortion in a particular German family, um, which was preserved across several generations. But of course, apart from that, there's the, the other non-abnormal structure that's preserved across many more generations, two eyes, um, hands, fingers, and so on. Of course, it doesn't always work perfectly. And he came up with a collection of ideas of which one of the most important was that quantum mechanics allows structures to exist that are relatively stable. And so they can reliably maintain information in the order of things, but they can also be changed in one of two ways. One is forcibly changed by bringing in high energy, which can dislodge some of the atoms and then they might be recombined in a different way. But another way uses catalytic reactions, which work as if by magic. You can have a catalyst in the presence of two other things, and the two things will be influenced by the catalyst somehow to change their relationship, to form a bond or to release bonds with very little energy required 
and the catalyst is left unchanged. It can be reused and so on. And, and, and Schrodinger had this idea that mechanisms like that are absolutely crucial for life and for reproduction. And uh, they explain, on the one hand, the stability that you need for reliable reproduction and so on, but also the changeability that you need for development and growth of a single organ organism. But at that stage, uh, the, the um, uh, structure of DNA had not been discovered by Watson and Crick and um, the, the woman that's, uh, in London, whose name I've forgotten. Um, and since then, there's been a huge amount of additional work going on, uh, including investigating kinds of transformations of molecular structures. Now, uh, some people have tried to produce movies illustrating some of the processes. And I've got a fragment of one which uh, is obviously uh, not realistic. This isn't a video of a real molecular thing. It's, it's hand-produced cartoon-like stuff. But I'll, I'll show it anyway. And you'll see some of the kinds of things, if I can make this work. Transcription. Can anyone hear what that's? OK, that's not coming through. It was just talking about you have a coding strand and a template strand. And these are coding strands. Transcription start. So there's a particular site that's used for starting transcription. And you know, at this stage, there must be other molecular structures that are quite complex that can initiate the transcription. So they come along and start unraveling things. Um, So there's something going on there. And there are particular elements that are used for these things, by these things. Maybe I'll just jump ahead. So you get these things assembling themselves around the DNA. And various processes happen that involve Co complex interactions, splitting these things apart. And I'm going to jump ahead. They do some separating of the strands. You can see they're beginning to separate over there. And then all sorts of other things. Energy is used in this process. And then new things are brought out, other things are recombined. Anyway, I'm going to stop there. Because uh, if you I will post uh, this thing. In fact, if you just um, if you remember that this is Oxford academic and uh, a transcription processes mRNA synthesized from a DNA template, you'll be able to find it. But I will, I'll, I'll post a link through the lug mailing list later on. So, and there are lots of things of that sort going on. There are also some videos taken with enormous difficulty of actual, using, using very powerful microscopes, actually observing some of these processes going on in real molecular transformation. Um, but it's harder f from those things to, to get an idea of what's going on. So where have I got to now? So the idea that I'm going to offer you is that um, Turing may have had some of that in mind when he wrote in 1950 uh, in Brain Chemistry, the least important electricity he may have been aware of some of the research going on in Cambridge. I don't know if 
Watson and Creek were already doing things that probably had started, although their main publications came out in 1952. Um, but he, the, Turing doesn't actually elaborate on this, as far as I can tell, in anything he wrote that was ever published or any notes that other people have, have um, later discovered or any of the discussions at the Ratio Club that he was a member of. But my suggestion is that he had, had ideas about the possibility that the combinations of processes of locking and unlocking and, and moving around might be important for intelligent animals um, in ways that go beyond what you can do with digital computers and Turing machines. He had previously in his thesis uh, stated that there's a difference between mathematical intuition and mathematical ingenuity. He didn't say what the difference was, but he said mathematical ingenuity can be replicated in computers. And so it was essentially, he was thinking of something that the mathematical ingenuity involves, following rules that have been set up, performing operations, changing things in rule bound way. That's the mathematical ingenuity. And he's claiming computer machines could do that. And of course his Turing machines could do that. And all the other things that are equivalent to Turing machines. But he didn't say what the alternative to ingenuity was. He just labeled it intuition and suggested that um, that's important in brains. But he didn't say there that it uses chemistry. But perhaps he was thinking of that when that, that distinction between intuition and ingenuity was in his thesis, which was pub, um, published in 1936 or 38, I forget which, but it was finished earlier than that. Um, but this sentence came much later in 1950. So perhaps things had gone on stewing in his brain about how, how can we get at this intuition, which is different from ingenuity. And maybe if he'd li lived on, he would have been in there with all the people unraveling these genetic processes and so on and trying to work out how you could make use of them to do things that computers can't do. Um, and I think I've probably gone way over my time uh, for talking about that. Uh, and I just want to see if there is anything much more. Okay, the Metacon figure genome idea is that when genes are expressed, this is a, a very odd sort of diagram produced with Jackie Chappell, who's a biologist in University of Birmingham with whom I've been interacting on and off since she came here in 2004. Um, the stuff comes out of the genome uh, in, in waves. And some of it comes at a very early stage and builds stuff and may interact with the environment, which in the case of a chick will be some of the stuff in the egg. Um, and other things will be something different. And that, that building may uh, produce not only new structures, but also new records of what happens if you do things. And then later on, more stuff comes out of the genome uh, through expression of uh, information that's in the genome that was not used earlier on. And when that comes out, it somehow makes use of what was previously discovered from these records combines it with behaviors and then performs new actions. And then later on, more sophisticated things come out through at later stages of development. And um, again, they get information that's been recorded uh, previously, uh, which is combined with stuff that's in there by substituting parameters. So the suggestion is that uh, the, the later genes express things that are more abstract. They've got gaps left in them. And the prime example of that for humans is human languages. Human languages have many layers of, of abstraction. There are the, the simple sounds, babbling sounds that a very young child makes. And after a young child has been in a community for a while, the babbling will be different depending on the community. A, a French child will babble slightly differently from an English 
child because uh, they've been getting feedback and training various muscles and so on. But at a later stage, they might have an ability to combine bits of babbling together to form longer things. And that ability to um, combine stuff may come at a later stage, which takes in the things that have been picked up earlier and uses them to produce new behaviors, uh, which can then interact with the environment to get produce new information. And you can think, think of the same thing being repeated and getting more and more complicated. And at later stages, very abstract uh, patterns might be expressed from the genome, which have very little detailed information about what they're about, what they do, but they can get abstract patterns that were found earlier and uh, combine them with these very abstract patterns to get less abstract patterns. And then that can produce something that can get even less abstract patterns. And eventually by putting in more and more parameters, you can get down to abilities to talk French or English or Urdu or Swahili or whatever the language is using the same abstract multi-layered abstract genome instantiated at different stages by things that were learned at different stages in that environment. Now that idea, I suspect, which is kind of visible in linguistic development because enormous numbers of linguists and, and other people have been studying these things. I suspect that it's, there, there are much more generally, other, there are other examples of that to do with physical behaviors and competences at different levels of abstraction and they're multi-layered. And that uh, the process of combining one of the abstract things that comes out of the genome with some of the stuff that was earlier discovered and stored in the brain may make use of molecular processes, combining structures, well, the way you saw in, the, in those videos. And that would be utterly, totally different from what goes on in neural nets where you have all these things trained with lots of statistics, but it's not at all clear where it would go on or how what we know about the physiology of the brains would be able to take these ideas and turn them into explanations of how Euclid and Pythagoras and Archimedes and Zeno, and of course, young children and apes and um, octopuses and so on, develop their spatial in, uh, high spatial intelligence and squirrels. So the, the metamorphogenesis project is to try to, um, I'll show you that one, uh, is to try to uh, fill in gaps in these ideas about uh, different kinds of abstraction, different kinds of development during the growth of an individual, but also different kinds of evolutionary development which produce these things. Humans will have, I suggest, more layers than any other known species, um, but intelligent animals like chimps and octopuses and um, uh, crows and so on may, will probably have more layers than earthworms and, and cockroaches and, and so on. Um, but they will, the layers aren't necessarily all nested in a single hierarchy. They, evolution may have had different things that branched out in different directions in different kinds of organisms. So the hope is that in a few hundred years time, some really clever people will have um, uh, taken these ideas and done something with them. Now, I'm now going to switch at the end to a lecture video lecture that was given by a very distinguished uh, physicist called Neil Turok, who had been, um, I actually met him many years ago when I visited Cambridge and gave a talk about not this stuff, some older stuff. Um, and after that, he went to, to various places and he was then, I think, the founding director of something called the Perimeter Institute in, in um, uh, Canada which brought together a whole lot of, of very bright physicists. And he has recently uh, moved to a distinguished chair in Edinburgh, I only discovered that a few days ago. And this lecture was given when he was still at the um, Perimeter Institute. Uh, it was done in 2015. And he talks a lot about what's known about physics and all the kinds of complexity. But the lecture is 
entitled The Astonishing Simplicity of Everything. And what he's claiming is that when you take all the advances from relativity and quantum physics and cosmology and all the discoveries of the last centuries, um, you can compress them into this equation, which I won't pretend to understand. Uh, he talks about it in the lecture and talks about where the bits come from um, and says all known physics comes out of that. Um, and they give all kinds of things, the masses of neutrinos and uh, uh, things about dark matter. And uh, if you think of something that looks a bit like this, uh, does, how's the lecture going to... Uh, you can't hear him. No, I thought this might change in some way. But anyway, um, it just looks much too simple to be an explanation of everything in the universe. Now, uh, my suspicion is that maybe it isn't, that there may be things that go on in the processes that I've been talking about inside the, the developing egg that the physicists haven't looked at because they're not interested in those things. Uh, uh, they don't play around with chicks and, and crocodiles also come out of eggs, um, let alone other animals and so on. And it may well be that if they did look, this is, I'm waving my hands, I have no compelling arguments, just saying uh, history of science shows that very often when you think you've got a deep understanding of most of the universe as happened, for instance, with Newtonian mechanics until fairly recently, uh, when you think you've got deep understanding of most of what happened, perhaps you'll then pay attention to something that doesn't fit. And maybe those processes of assembly of new structures and not just physical structures, but capabilities, reasoning abilities and so on, in the processes of development of an, of a, of an organism that I've been waving my hands about, perhaps will require something to be added to all this, but I, I, I can't say any more than perhaps, and it's pretty arrogant of me to suggest that someone as bright as that might have actually um, missed something in physics. Um, especially someone who gave up physics many years ago um, and has learned very little since. Okay, so I think I've got through um, a, a lot of the detail, perhaps too much detail with not enough clarity. And I'm now saying that neither logic-based nor deep learning in neural nets can match, logic-based AI nor deep learning neural nets can match the kinds of things that we see in um, biology, including the spatial reasoning, not only of the ancient mathematicians, um, Euclid and Archimedes and uh, Pythagoras and Zeno and all those people, and they were on different, different continents. They weren't just ancient Greeks and Egyptians, Babylonians and Indians and Chinese. And I think a lot of them independently discovered Pythagoras theorem and proved it in different ways. Um, I'm suggesting that the kinds of um, uh, mechanisms that made all those things possible may be totally unlike anything that we have in current AI. And therefore that raises deep challenges about whether we can extend AI or whether the only way to get those extra mechanisms is in living, living organisms, which would be an interesting discovery if it's true. Okay, so coming back here, I have a stop share and Where's my, yeah, we are. And I will, I guess, let um, Charles um, take charge. Have I got to do anything more? No, I think that's, 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 that was very good, Aaron. It, it really, I enjoyed it, and I think, I don't know how we do this on Zoom. Well, I can't uh, hear everybody, but I've now switched to gallery mode, and I can <laughs> see quite a number of smiling spaces. One or two looking mildly sceptical, but <laughs> that cured that one. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway. Um, questions? Yes. I, I'm willing to listen if anyone wants to say anything. I have one curiosity. 
Um, obviously, can you hear me? This is someone speaking with a rather muffled mic. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? I can hear, yes, okay. Um, I had one curiosity, obviously, uh, neural networks are inspired by the way that the brain is wired. But I was curious, do you have an idea of how many neurons are in the human brain compared to how many sort of nodes would be in a typical neural network? Um... Tom has been talking to a neuro, neuroscientist, um, if he's still with us, Tom Cabaza. Uh, the answer is maybe he, Brazilian hmm? or so, at least in a Brazilian male. Uh, his mic is uh, muted. Anyway, the, it's um, the number of neurons in in the brain is um, uh, two to quite a large number, uh, but it's um, uh, there are many different kinds performing many different functions, it's, and the there are different sub portions of the brain where you'll have common sets of neurons. For instance, the retina is an extension of the brain. Uh, the neurons, as you can think of them as coming out of the brain to collect infant photons, which are then partially transformed locally, uh, closer back to the brain and then send signals in them. Um, sorry, but was that le leading up to something that I've, uh, that you want to add? So, so, just, I just to clarify the question. Yeah. yeah, so I was just wondering, is it, I guess, is it possible to, or is it practical to build neural networks on a computer that are comparable in size and complexity as the oh. human well. brain? Does that make sense? The, uh, there are people saying that later this century we'll be able to build computers which can, which have power similar to the number of neurons in the brain. However, the, most of the people who think in those terms ignore chemistry. Now, the number of molecules in each neuron is pretty large. And if a lot of the kinds of processing that brains use uh, in uh, performing various intelligent actions, including solving my problem about slicing a polyhedron, if you've done all that, um, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the molecular processes in each neuron will be pretty complicated. Uh, there are lots of, lots of molecules and there are different kinds of molecules within each neuron. There are also chemical signals that move between neurons, um, hormones uh, and, and other kinds of things. But those chemical signals between neurons will be relatively slow. They may affect things like how sleepy you are or, or how hungry you are or something, um, or whether something needs to change its distribution of resources in the body or whatever. Um, but if, if, if molecular processing plays a role in, solve, in reasoning, in solving problems, it will almost certainly have to be within each neuron. And within each neuron, um, I, I should have looked up numbers be, before we come, a bit before this talk, but there will be, um, I would guess, uh, hundreds of thousands at least of molecules per neuron and uh, if there are millions of neurons in a brain, that means there are going to be lots and lots of molecules doing things. And um, there may also be things going on that Roger Penrose, some of you may have heard of him, he's a very distinguished physicist. He's recently got a Nobel Prize at last. Should have had it earlier. Um, and he's been claiming for some time that uh, 
the things that go on in brains are not explained either by standard computers. And I think many of his examples are similar to the examples I've been using. Um, he came up with geometrical examples totally independently, uh, uh, as far as I know, whereas I was inspired by Immanuel Kant, uh, so mine weren't quite so independent. But he was a, he was a brilliant mathematician and uh, he naturally got involved in thinking about structures and how you reason about them. And was able to start thinking about how whether a computer could do the things that he personally was doing. And he thought what he knew about computers made that seem impossible. And that was what led him to publish a book called The Emperor's New Mind, which was published about 1989 and caused a real stir because he was saying computers aren't going to be able to do enough. And he waved his hands in the book. And then he um, was uh, 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 contacted by a neuroscientist called Hameroff in California, Stuart Hameroff, who said, oh, I've got a theory about how things work in brains in microtubules, which involve quantum processes, and maybe those will enable you to do what you want. And of course, um, uh, Penrose was very interested in that, and they keep in, kept on interacting. And the way it looks to me is that Hameroff keeps on saying, and I think what Roger is talking about can happen in these microtubules. And then he waves his hands a bit and assumes that Penrose is going to explain how microtubules do it. And Penrose doesn't commit himself. He says he thinks it's got things to do with chemistry and, compute and, uh, and um, quantum processes. Um, but he doesn't yet know how. But maybe they've got something to do with Hameroff's microtubules. So there's a bunch of ideas floating around there which are saying hello to one another. But as far as I can tell, they haven't engaged in producing any argument that I can understand that amounts to an explanation of how Euclid or Zeno or you when you followed these proofs, uh, how, how you're able to do those things. So um, there may be other people that I don't know of who've gone further than them, or it may just be that uh, Penrose has actually produced explanations that I've failed to understand. Um, if any of you do find out anything about that and can make sense of it, I'll be delighted to hear from you. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, has, I, I has, think that's the most I can say in answer to that question. Has anybody got the answer to the slicing the polyhedron. Um, I think I think I saw Ellis with a pencil and a piece of paper when when the question was asked. Well, okay, so what happens to the number of vertices, edges and faces when you remove exactly one vertex? So you're going to add one I, extra I face. You're going to add one extra face. A very big one. A big, you get a big face. You Well, I mean, you go on to infinity, right? Because you open it up. No, you uh, you leave it closed. Sorry, it's a solid polyhedron. I should have said that. So when you slice off one vertex, you're left with a new solid polyhedron. So you only get one new face. Okay. So, and f I mean, I'm assuming from that, we can then work out how many edges and vertices we have. But. Okay, has anyone actually worked it out? Oh, Ellis? Oh. <laughs> yeah, anyway, it, it's, um, oh, it's, there's no point in my switching to the other thing, you won't see it, but um, uh, it's not too hard to think about uh, the number of edges that get cut and the number of faces that remain, even though they're made smaller, and um, I think someone's already said you get one new face. Uh, and from that, you can work out a formula. And um, people find that not very difficult. And, and all I'm saying uh, is that the fact that brains can do that, even brains of people who've never previously studied Euclidean geometry, they take you know, a little bit of introduction to, uh, to learn what a polyhedron is, and then they can start thinking about it. They can use the form of reasoning that the ancient mathematicians used 
in the distant past. We've all got it and you can use it without any special training if you're given enough stimulation. But I will add one thing that two years after I came up with that problem and I talked to many people about it, um, something happened to me, someone made a comment which made me think again. And I realized there was something I had missed and I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but if anyone <laughs> thinks about it and wants to send an email message to the log post. Um, so you first will find an answer and then if you think about it some more, you may find another answer, but it's a very special case. I've probably given it a game away. I guess um, with, a lot of, with a lot of these geometrical proofs, it's, it's difficult to know that you've covered all bases. So yes. in, intuitively, um, I don't know, I, from what I understand, the number of Lacatose. number of edges is, mm -hmm. is the number of lines that you cut through. Uh, and yeah. The number of vertices is the number of, you add on the number of lines you've cut through minus one, because you've taken one vertex off. But then, so that's my in, intuitive thinking, but I don't know if I've covered all bases and there might be counter examples that I think you can't cover that unless you have a, I guess, a more thorough mathematical proof. Right. Well, you? The, 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 I know only one counter example, but it doesn't make much difference to the answer. But I will, there is some history to this. Uh, some of you may have heard of a, a philosopher of science and philosopher of mathematics called Imre Lakatos, L A K A. TOS. Um, there's a building named after him at LSE, the Lakatos building. Oh, yes. Uh, if you can see Luke's uh, image on the, if you go into gallery view, he's holding up a, a, the book by Lakatos called Proofs and Refutations. And um, a very excellent, famous mathematician called Euler, some of you will have heard of his, his name. Um, produced what was called Euler's theorem, which was a theorem about polyhedra without any slicing. It was just, if you have any solid bounded by planar faces where the planar faces meet at straight edges, and then some of them, those edges will meet at vertices and the whole thing is completely enclosed. He proved using a geometrical argument, uh, which involved transforming the thing through a whole collection of operations, which I'm not going to try to go through, that in all cases, V minus two plus E equals F, vertices minus two plus edges equals faces, or you can write that in different ways. I think I've got the formula right, but it doesn't really matter. The point is that he produced a proof. And then someone found a counter example. Uh, one, uh, one counter example, is a cube. So if oh, you can't see what I mean, maybe you can if you've got them. a cube, which has got another cube stuck on one face in the middle of it. So you have one cube growing out of another cube. And um, one of the steps in Euler's proof requires all the edges of the polyhedron to be connected via other edges. But if you stick a cube on top of the, on the middle of the face, then the new cube will form edges where it meets the face. And those four edges will be connected to edges in the cube that have just been added, but they're not connected to any of the old edges. It's just gone into the middle of the surface. So that bit is disconnected and therefore part of the proof that Euler gave breaks down. And then other people found other counter examples. Um, for example, if you start with a cube and then you drill a square tunnel through the center of that cube, through going in at one face and coming out in the opposite face, you have a polyhedron. It's bounded completely by planar faces that meet at straight edges and so on, satisfies the standard definition of a polyhedron, uh, but it's not convex and it's got this hole through it. It turns out 
that one of the steps in Euler's proof involved cutting a hole in the thing and stretching it out f flat and then doing things to the lines that you get. Well, once you've cut the, a tunnel through a cube, uh, there's no way to cut out one face and then stretch it out flat. Uh, you'll always have the problem of this extra tunnel joining one face to another and not going flat, and therefore the proof breaks down. So what that illustrates is the comment that I think uh, the, the previous speaker in a window labeled Jenny <laughs> waving a hand, um, the comment was that you can have mathematical proofs and mathematical geniuses making mistakes. And these mistakes often can lead to, when they're discovered, can lead to a modification of the original proof or the original theorem and a whole new branch of mathematics to deal with the new cases that have been discovered. And so that's one of the ways that the ability of human mathematicians to make mistakes and not to notice features of what they've already studied that can generate new mathematics. And that keeps on happening in the history of mathematics. But I think it still leaves Immanuel Kant's point that you can make these amazing discoveries as the ancient, ancient uh, mathematicians did. And you can find proofs that teach you things. The proofs, they, although the proofs may not cover everything. Oh, there's a cat getting a lecture now. Um, uh, the proofs may, <laughs> may um, be very important for um, uh, engineering. Oh, we have uh, cats and poodles and, <laughs> and maybe all sorts of other animals listening to this conversation. Um, Squirrel in the back garden who, who yeah. Anyway, we now have a message saying each neuron contains 50 billion proteins. Well, I knew it was a lot, uh, but I didn't know the number. So it's going to take some time. And if there are millions of neurons, it's not going to be this century or next that we're going to have enough digital switches. And in fact, it may be that the sizes of the components, the minimal size of a digital electronic switch is so large compared with the space you need for a chemical bond that can be on or off, that you might not even be able to fit enough uh, digital switches to, uh, to replicate the functionality of a human brain, might not fit into a whole galaxy. I don't know, I'm just wildly, uh, might not fit on a planet anyway. So that's, that's sort of wild uh, exaggeration perhaps. Um, anyway, uh, Luke has something. Yeah, I've asked, actually, I, I typed my question out. Can any everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Okay, so so um, I could read my question, or Aaron, if you want to go up if, to thirteen it. colon ten, you can read my question. Um, I'm actually uh, I'm, I'm actually trying to see how what you've been on about with respect to chemical computing relates to something you said earlier about representations, where you were uh, criticizing. Um, people who claim that representations must somehow stand in for or resemble, which are different cases, that which which they represent. So is not your appeal to chemistry uh, potential, I mean, I can see ways out, but I'd, I'd like you to um, help. Um, is not your appeal to chemistry potentially uh, susceptible to the same kind of criticism or would it make you revise what you wrote earlier with some qualifications? Well nothing that I have said and nothing that I've ever heard about uh, the chemical processes involved in reproduction and so on implies that the molecular processes uh, resemble the things that they produce in any way. So all I'm saying is that there may be processes, uh, and perhaps I can say a little bit more about that, processes that involve use of um, changes in um, shape, spatial relationships, and bonding, which add to processes that merely change the bonding, which is what digital computers can be thought of as doing. They just have switches on or off, or processes that merely collect lots of data and then derive probabilities, which is what neural nets do. Um, the, the, you can say that the chemical processes that I'm talking about have a combination of two things, 
one of which is there in the digital systems, namely connections may be made or not, or, 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 or not made or undone, but they also can allow continuous deformations, which may allow changes in assembly of molecular, of, of, of more complex molecular structures that are then going to be used in one of two ways. One is to provide the parts that are needed for, for the body, the, namely the, the bits of material that are needed for bones or muscles or blood or whatever the cells, but they may also be used for assembling new structures that are gonna be used later for reasoning mechanisms or for further derivation from DNA to new structures, further transcription. So in those processes that are still concerned with getting information out of DNA and into structures, um, I am saying there may or go on continually being combinations of discrete and continuous processes. And, and you were suggesting that there's a trap there that I may be falling into. Uh, well, I get. I think you've 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 worked out of the trap um, because you use the word resemble. So I guess it's a point. It's a it's it's a potentially at least for me interesting point of clarification of what you had said earlier uh, relating those two ideas. So what you're saying now is that there's if if uh, to to really get to the kinds of computing that uh, biological brains are capable of, we may need to use we need to use materials that have that have physical properties. That's all that have the phys physical properties that can make this possible and some forms of the kinds of the kinds of underlying physical and formal uh, mechanisms and constraints that we've been looking at or systems, if you will, are just just um, are not suitable or maybe don't do not make it possible to realize what human brains do. And, and this may possibly require to make the statement true, considering physical constraints on, you know, just physical constraints that physics will not allow this to happen, would be given oh. we don't have enough space or time. But maybe going back to what you were saying in the in the 90s or earlier, you, you were saying, well, you know, if you could allow for infinite time and, and infinite computing power, then uh, maybe these forms of representations can work these non these these, these more traditional forms of representation. But now I think you would actually not agree with that. <laughs> well, I don't. I said a lot. I, I, I don't remember what, everything I said in the '90s, but it sounds as if I might have made a mistake then. But the one thing I have not yet claimed is that we will ever be able to produce artificial computers to do what brains do. I have a completely open mind about that, and it may well be that we can only do it in very limited cases. You might be able, for instance as some kind of uh, technology for repairing brain damage. You put something into a bit of brain that replaces the functionality, but I, I, I just don't know. I mean, people are already doing that to some extent um, with, trans with cochlear implants and so on. Uh, I don't know that anyone will be able to replace bits of damaged retina with an artificial bit of retina. Um, although people are trying to attach cameras that send stimuli to the skin of, blind, of a blind person, which is a sort of replacement, but are they, they're, they do something, but uh, not in the way that uh, retinal cells do it. But they may be able to find a tiny, you can, if you've got one of those and you're blind, you may be able to detect when some, you're approaching something very large because a large pattern of stimulation is changing on your skin, say. Um, anyway, at, at the moment, my sole aim and the only things I write about are what we need to do to understand what's going on, but I'm not myself concerned with replicating it. I have no particular desire to replicate it, and I don't know whether it will ever be possible to replicate that functionality for the reasons that you're hinting at. Was there really anyone else?